a year of prayer. We're still digging in. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness and your love and your grace and your mercy. God, thank you for those precious souls last night and then again this morning that they, they raised their hand and said, I need you. I receive you. Thank you that salvations are happening. Thank you, Lord, for these two young men who went public and said, I want to follow Jesus with all of my life, and I don't care who knows. Thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would remove me. I've got nothing good to say outside of your word, but that your word would go forward, and it would complete the purpose for which you sent it. Challenge our hearts today to not just be a church that prays, but a praying church. Yeah. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, and the church said, amen. amen. The constantly praying church, in reference to that, normally we have our night of prayer the last Monday night of every month, but because of the holiday, it will be tomorrow night, six to eight, child care, zero to five, you say, well, my, I got a six-year-old, seven-year-old, the kind of rambunctious. Who cares? Bring them. Yeah. Let them run around. It's not formal. People are just praying. And um, You think they had nursery in the New Testament church? Y'all go on out and play with the sheep. <laughs> I don't know, Andrew. I don't know what they did. But, uh, yeah, what a, what a glorious time. If you can't make that night, you know, for whatever reason, but you have some time between six and eight, shut the noise off, pray at your house. Good? So we dove into Acts chapter 12 as we have been just in this journey, a year of prayer, teaching on prayer for an entire year, and the power of prayer, the power of repentance. And we worked up to verse five and six. I'll go ahead and read Acts 12, 1 through 10, and we'll be here next week and the next week, so if you missed last week, go, go back and catch up. So Acts 12, 1 through 10, now, now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. I'll give you a timeline here. This is Herod. He's the grandson of the Herod who was reigning when Christ was crucified, All right? So he was in charge. So I could give you a kind of a timeline. So he, he's harassing the church. He's making it hard for him to meet. And <clears throat> so he sees that that's gaining the approval of people. So he, he kills James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, this is very important because this is not James, Jesus' brother. This is James, one of the disciples, one of the 12. Not only was he one of the 12, he was one of the three. If you don't know what I mean by that, Many times in the Bible, you'll read Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. And they went up on the mountain, Peter, James, and John. And they went to the garden to pray, and they went further, Peter, James, and John. Jesus went into the house and told everybody to get out, but he took in with him Peter, James, and John. Up until this point, the New Testament church is popping off, man. Besides Stephen being martyred, people are getting healed. The Holy Ghost, the day of Pentecost has happened which the Church of Brawl celebrates that today, the day of Pentecost. And so Holy Spirit is sent just like Jesus said he would. Peter goes out, preaches, thousands upon thousands upon thousands are saved. You got the, the beggar at the gate beautiful who gets healed. You got Peter who models what Jesus did when he walked into the bedroom. He says the same words that Jesus said to the little girl and the woman gets up out of bed, comes back to life. I mean, you guys, stuff happened. Peter's walking down the road. His shadow is hitting uh, people who are, are, are lame or they're getting healed. And, and so there's quite the uproar, oh, yeah. all right? And this thing's happening. Oh, yeah. And then you get one verse. Out of all we read about James and what he did, and you get one verse. Herod kills him. You know, God uses things 
And he used, I proved this last week through scripture, so I won't jump back into it, but when James was killed, there was an awakening in the church of, uh uh-oh, like he was one of the 12, and they got to him, this is serious. And I wonder, and I asked the question last week, I may not have in the third service, because we, that just kind of went a different way, and we, we just let the Lord do what he did, but, you know, I wonder what it's going to take for the church of 2024 before we, we wake up. Verse three, and because he saw that it pleased Jews, now this is a total political move. Herod was a politician. He saw that it pleased the Jews. His approval rating went up. He proceeded further to seize Peter because he had heard about Peter. Peter was causing all kinds of of stuff. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and, and delivered him to the four squads, 16 soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Why is that? Because he knew that if he brought him out during, during the Feast of the Unleavened Bread before the Passover, that the Jews would not come out. They, they, did, they wouldn't come out. So the crowd would be smaller. He wouldn't get as much press. And, you know, politicians love press. So he waited. What he didn't know was he thought he was being coy, but by waiting... What he does is he gives the church a chance to be the church. Because in verse 5, it says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer, say it with me, constant was offered to God for him by the, not by someone else, not by his mama, not by his his grandma, by the, you see, Peter is, in a jail cell chained to two soldiers that's inside of a jail cell, that's inside of a jail, that's inside of a prison that's surrounded by a courtyard, that's surrounded by a wall that is unpassable only through a gate that's iron that has to be opened into the city by teams of horses. Pretty dark situation. So the church prays, verse 6, and when Herod was about to bring him out, That night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. So where we left off last week is how in the world was Peter able to sleep? Like, how do you sleep knowing that your buddy James that you grew up fishing with is dead by the hand of the guy who had you arrested? Your your head, you're going to get executed publicly tomorrow. And we landed on two reasons. One, complete trust in God's sovereignty. Peter was like, if it's my time, it's my time. I'm tired. But also, because he knew he had a group of people, brothers and sisters, not biological, but through the blood of Jesus, people of like faith, the New Testament church, the local church, he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt there were a group of people that were somewhere in that city And they weren't tossing up a prayer like, Lord, help Peter. They were constantly, and that word constantly is fervently, earnestly praying. If you know God loves you and his plans for you are good, and you know you have people that are crying out to God for you, when you're in an impossible situation, there's a level of peace Paul calls it in Philippians that transcends understanding. Transcends understanding. So that's where Peter was. We'll read the rest of the story and then we'll dig in. Verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself, tie on your sandals, And he said to him, put on your garment. In other words, get dressed. Get up and get dressed. Verse 9. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done was by the angel. He didn't know it was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard post, in the coming weeks we'll get to this, they came to the iron gate. 
that leads to the city. It opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. So we see in, in verse 5, and the church play, prayed constantly. I'll read some notes that I wrote down in, here in my phone. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but the church was free to pray. When every other gate in our life is shut and locked, the gate of heaven is wide open, and we take advantage of that gate through prayer. Constant prayer was offered to God for him. The word constant also has the idea of earnest. Literally, literally the word pictures someone stretching out all they can for something. The verb ectinos is related to ectinese, a medical term describing stretching of a muscle to its limits. Luke uses this word ectinos in Luke chapter 22 when he describes the fervency in which Jesus is praying in the garden unto sweating drops of blood. Wow. Same word. Hear this. Much of our prayer is powerless because it lacks earnestness. Too often we almost pray with the attitude of wanting God to care about things we really don't care about. Earnest prayer has power not because it in itself persuades a reluctant God. Instead, it demonstrates that our heart cares, but not only cares, it cares passionately about the things that God cares about. Prayer was made for Peter without ceasing. This is still rocking me right here. I want you to hear this. For prayers and tears are the church's arms, therewith which we fight, not only against our enemies, but for our friends. And it's to this means that we have recourse. Peter's in prison. They pray constantly, earnestly, fervently. They pray in public. They pray on the way home. They pray, they put the kids to bed and they pray. They go to their prayer closet and pray. They pray all night. They get up the next day and they pray and they keep praying. And they're praying. And they're praying. And they're praying. Because at this point, every other gate is shut. Every other door is closed. There seems to be no way out. It's very dark. Business is going under. Marriage will never make it. That lost child's not coming. Like, there's, I don't see it. How, I just don't under, I don't see how, the, it's too dark. I'm too chained up. The addiction's too strong. But the church prayed. My God, we can get people to do just about anything. I could, I could literally stand up in front of you and say, hey, there is Cross town, a house, and it's in shambles. It needs to be restored. I could tell you a story about it. It's got to be painted, da 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 da. I'd have a hundred men within an hour sign up to go do that because that's who you are. I could stand up here and say, hey, there's so and so that's in a bad situation. It's dark. There's no way out. They need prayer from their church body. And you might say, yeah, I'll pray for them. But would you sweat in prayer? Because you'd sweat at that house. Would you get blisters on your knees in prayer? I don't know. Maybe you would. Maybe you wouldn't. I know this. The church abroad has totally missed the weapon the effectiveness, the power of the praying church. I don't want to pastor that church. I'm so blessed to pastor a church that's generous. I pastor a church that reads their Bible. And I'm so, so proud that we are learning to be a church that prays, a praying church constantly. So we made it through verse six. We'll pick up in verse seven, that first part. So number one, the constantly praying church prays in faith that the presence of God is already present in the need. It's very important because James tells us that, you know, 
when you pray, you have to believe that God hears you. And I proved that in scripture last week. I won't go through that. Because if, if you don't believe that God's listening, then your prayers aren't gonna last long and they're not gonna be very fervent. So we pray and we pray with fervency constantly and we're, we're not asking God to be involved in the situation because we know God is already present. We're asking God to move in this situation. Yeah. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. I've preached this story. It's been years, but I've never studied it in the original text like I have in this idea of a year of prayer and especially some personal things that I've, I've been going through with some loved ones and people in my life and some of you. And the original text here alludes to the fact that, you know, because when we read this, the church prays and we think God sends an angel. Uh-uh. An angel is there. An angel is there waiting for God to tell him what to do because angels can't do anything. Everything they do is at the command of God. But the important thing to, to get here is no matter how dark, no matter how tight the chains, no, how, no matter how bleak the outlook, God is with you. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The best definition I've ever heard of a friend is one who runs in when everybody, one who walks in when everybody else is walking out. You ever been through a season of your life and you thought you had friends, and things got a little squirrely, and, and, and all of a sudden people just, not, they ain't answering phone calls, and they're just walking out on you, and some of them don't even walk out. They walk out and gossip, or they walk out and shoot you in the back as they're leaving. And true definition of a friend is one who walks in when everyone else is walking out. That's Jesus. Fact is, he can't walk in if you've already invited him in. He never left. He won't leave. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He is a friend that sits closer than her brother. He's the midnight talker, the valley walker. He's close to the brokenhearted. He came to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. No matter what you're going through today, I want you to know this. He's concerned, and he cares. He's there. He's present. Whether you've Put your faith in Jesus and you're saved. If you've done that, he's obviously with you because the Bible says that do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you. When you put your faith in Jesus, the spirit of God indwells you. It's biblical. If you've not been saved yet, doesn't mean God loves you any less. He died for you. He's just working from the outside in, but he sees you and he cares for you. And he prays for you. And he wants to say welcome home to you. So saved or unsaved, God sees what you're going through. And remember, Jesus experienced every emotion we will ever experience when he walked the face of this earth. The presence of God is a very real, tangible thing. You don't have to get goosebumps. You don't have to, you know, God is present. Yeah. Psalms 91, let's work through some of these scriptures for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your way. For he shall give his angels charge over you so that everything's gonna work out just the way you thought it would. No. We could go back to verse two and ask James about that. Right? No, in all of your ways. He is present with you. The Bible says in Psalms 34, verse seven, the angels of the Lord encamp all around those who fear him and he delivers them according to his will. Think about this, the angels of the Lord encamping around you. Second Kings chapter six, I haven't preached this yet in reference to prayer, but I will. Elisha, his servant, City surrounded, servant gets up early in the morning, goes out, sees the armies that have come to kill Elisha. Oh, alas, 
Pastor, what are we going to do? Elisha's having his Starbucks or six bucks. We used to call it four bucks, five bucks. It's not Starbucks. It's six bucks. He's just chilling out, and he says, Lord, would you please open his eyes so that he could see there are more for us than against us? And when Elisha prayed that, the servant's eyes were open, and he saw the army that was surrounding him surrounded by another army of horses of fire and chariots encamped around them. Psalms 46 says that our God is a very present help in times of trouble. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea and the waves just go crazy, swell, they roar. There is a city whose rivers make glad, the city of Zion. That's the church. That's the Holy Spirit living water flowing through the church. What that verse means is in the present. I can't live in yesterday and I can't live in tomorrow. I can't. If you figured out how to do that, please let me know. I'm not a betting man, but I don't think God would mind if we bet on uh, something coming up if we knew that. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. If you have a gambling problem, recovery group. I can't live in yesterday. I don't live in yesterday, and I don't live in tomorrow. I live in the present. So I can't say, God, why weren't you there yesterday? And I can't worry about God being there for me tomorrow. All I can do is take God at his word. And his word said, he is refuge and strength. And he is very present in my trouble. We got to acknowledge that. God doesn't run out on you when you mess up. Religion, religion says I messed up, my dad's going to kill me. Relationship says I messed up, I got to call my dad. Well, he's Abba, he's the greatest father ever. He's not going anywhere. He's present. He was present with Peter. There was an angel that stood there. You can't get away from his presence. He's everywhere, he's God. Psalms 139, where could I go from your presence, your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about you. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide hide from you, but the night shines as day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Jesus says to the disciples before he ascends, I will be with you always. Matthew 28, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. John 14, 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. Are you getting the picture? You are not alone in what you're going through. You may feel alone, but you can't trust your feelings. God cares. He sees you. Well, how come he's not fixing it? I don't know. I'm not God. I know our part's to ask. I taught that last week. Jesus said it over and over. Ask, 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 ask. Our responsibility is not the outcome. It's just to ask. Where's the church that's going to pray fervently even for the one who can't pray for themselves? Peter's sleeping. He's bound up. Outside of supernatural intervention, he's going to die. But he's at peace. He trusts the sovereignty of God, and he knows there's a church that's earnestly praying. Now, watch this. The constantly praying church, number two, brings light into the darkness. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. Now, watch this. And a light shone in the prison. An angel of the Lord is standing beside him, waiting on the command of God. And this is just becoming such a reality to me. So you got Peter who's going to die. He's chained up. He's asleep. 
there's an angel hanging out doing angel things. I don't know, you know. He's probably poking the guards or something. They can't see him. God is funny. He is. I mean, you know, look at some of the creatures he created. Look at yourself. <laughs> He's got a sense of humor. But there's a church that's earnestly, constantly praying without ceasing. God hears the fervent prayer, and it lines up with his will because he's not done with Peter yet. Hence, first and second Peter. Peter hadn't written those books yet that are in the Bible. Pastor Anthony was reminding me, we wouldn't have another book of the Bible because Peter mentored the writer and the author of that Bible, that book. God wasn't done with Peter yet. He used the death of James to wake the church up but his will and purpose for Peter wasn't finished. So when a church prays fervently and it lines up with the will of God, God then hears, leans in, hears, and in that moment, there's a transaction. Don't know how it happens, but there's a transaction. There's, there's a dispatch that goes out to that angel. And when, when the angel hears from God, the darkness turns into light. Because when God sends his power to intervene into a situation, darkness flees. Darkness cannot be around light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, you and I, the church, are the light of the world. You can't hide a city on a hill. Who lights a candle and then hides it under a basket? Uh-uh. Oh, that Coastline Community Church would be a light, a lighthouse, a place of hope, a place of safety, a place where people can come and know that they're going to experience God. Not a blinding light, not a five million lumen, you're a terrible person, why are you dressed like that, why do you live that way, why do you believe that way? Get out of here, you're not like us. Uh-uh. A light that says it's welcoming, it's warm. Now, we love you. We love you enough. We're gonna preach the Bible, we're gonna tell you the truth, but just because the truth doesn't line up with how you're living doesn't make you a bad person. You're just not informed that God loves you so much that he gave you this book to live by, and if you'll live by it, he will radically transform your life, and the things that you think are bringing you joy and fulfillment and identity, will, will, it'll, it'll change on a dime, and you'll realize you are his beloved. You are the apple of his eye. You are his thoughts for you number the sand on the seashore. He thinks about you all the time. He knows when a hair falls from our head. He knows what you think before you think it. He hears your prayers before you pray them. Oh, that we would be a light in the darkness. A light shone in the prison. There was no darker place at that time for Peter than the prison. Light runs darkness off. You take bitterness, anger, hatred. I, I want to ask you to raise your hand, or if you're online, I can't see. I tell you, if you're online, raise your hand, because I can't see you. <laughs> if you're alone. How many of you have been, don't raise your hand. But how many, how many of us have been hurt so deeply, maybe abused, rejected, walked out on, and the wound is so deep, it runs through the main vein of your emotions, your soul, your heart, and you have learned over the years to cover it up, and now it's so calloused and scabbed, and you love the Lord, but man, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a bowling 
there's an underlying boiling of anger. It's going to explode one day. Many times with those that caused you no harm. But you live with this bitterness, and you've learned to deal with it, but you're not going to go there. See, that, that, that's the trick of the enemy because that's a dark place. It's covered up. No light. Well, if you will let the healing balm of Gilead, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, begin to, to just ooze over that scab and, 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 and remove that scab, and if you'll let the love of God just open that wound up, that, that pus of bitterness and anger and hatred, light will begin to shine into that dark place. And when light enters into darkness, darkness has to flee because that's what light does. It runs darkness off. I'm funny like this. This place gets real dark at nighttime, and I'm here a lot when the sun's not up. And so I know exactly how many steps it is from that door to that corner, from that corner to that door. I, I can close my eyes, and now the staff has fun. People who know this have fun with this. Sometimes they'll move the chairs. <laughs> but this room will get really, really, really dark until you hit a switch. And what's, what's the switch? The switch turns the light on. What's the light do? Chases the darkness out. Chases the darkness out. What if the church quit complaining about the darkness, fearing the darkness, getting on our social platforms and railing against some, some uh, political agenda or some, somebody somewhere, uh, something, somehow, and ah! you know, what, what you're doing is you're entering into darkness. You're entering into the drama of the darkness that's prevailing over our world. Right? What if we, instead of doing that, just said, you know what? I'm going to be the light of the world, and I'm going to fervently, passionately pray for my country, for my city, for my community, for my family. I'm going to cry out to God. I'm going to ask him to fix this. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. Never more prophetic than today. No one can fix what's going on today except God. And God is waiting for some church somewhere to start passionately, fervently praying about the things that he cares about. And you may tell you what those things are. Those things are children who cannot protect themselves, lost people who are going to spend eternity in hell, the abused, the hopeless, the hurting, the needy, the hungry, the naked, the in prison. God cares about that. How do I know he cares? Because he said he did in the Bible. God blesses the church that gets about his business and cares about what he cares about. Micah 7, 8 says, do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I'll rise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord's going to be a light to me. In other words, I'm not alone even when I'm alone. 1 John 1, 5, this is the message which we have heard from him, declared to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness. John 1, 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Do you know what that word comprehend in its original text means right there? Confuses. When you worship your way through a season of hell, it confuses the enemy. When you get out of bed and go have your quiet time a day after you experience the tragedy and you sit with Jesus and you've got no words, but by faith you get out of bed and you go sit in a chair and you might not be able to say anything, but you're there to meet with him. It confuses the enemy. When people in your workplace do you wrong, talk about you, and you just turn around and look at them and smile, knowing God, God is your defender, they can't comprehend it. It confuses them. Why? Because it's light. Open up the windows. 
Let the light in. Open up the windows. Let the light. Tear the wound open. Let the light in. Let him heal from the inside out. Run the darkness out of your home. Run the darkness out of. Listen, when you leave here today, our dispersing should always be more powerful than our gathering. You get in that car and you take your route back home, you pray against evil and for your friends. I was raised in a part of town where, or in the inner city of Memphis, if you're raised in a place like that, you just see things that other people don't see. Raina was raised in a very nice neighborhood, and we could be somewhere together, and, and there's a drug deal going on over here, or there's something going on, I'm watching this stuff go down, and, and she's oblivious to it because she didn't grow up that way, right? I mean, she just doesn't, you know, you look around our community and in our county and, 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 our, and just around our area, and you look at certain street corners and blocks, there's strongholds on them. There's lodges, there's, there's little stores that sell certain stuff. There's, there's strongholds. Pray against that mess. It was defeated at the cross. When he died on the cross, he, he, he prevailed over every spiritual power and principality and authority and dominion of darkness, we already win. Third thing, when the church prays, the activity of the miracle is set in motion. Notice I didn't say when the church prays, the miracle happens. The activity of the miracle is set in motion. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison and struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off. Now, we all want the chains to fall off, don't we? But in our culture, we want the chains to fall off with no work involved. Right? I mean, we we just want, we want to get paid. We don't want to work. We, we, we We have allowed the church to become a church who is, um, illegally on disability in the spiritual sense. Because we want the blessings of God, the promises of God, without the process of God. Because we're entitled. It doesn't work that way. I'm telling you, if God's blessed you in this, in this life, and there are some very blessed people that attend our church, but most of them that I know, they walk with humble gratitude of that blessing. And if you're here and you're new to our church and God's blessed you with the things of this world and he's been good to you and you've not experienced a lot of hell in your life and he's blessed you in different ways, I'm telling you, that's all the more reason to get on your face and pray fervently and earnestly for those who are going through hell. Now, get this. So Peter... I love reading the Bible. I love, like, seeing it. So Peter's got an angel standing beside him. And we know later in the story, and we'll get to this, that when Peter goes to the house where they were praying, he knocks on the door, and this girl comes to the door and goes back and tells the people in there, hey, Peter's at the door. And they're like, shh. I can't wait to preach that message. I mean, the very thing the church was praying for had happened. And they're telling her to shut up because they need to keep praying. (laughs) They said it's probably his angel. So they said angels were, they're all through the Bible. So maybe it was, maybe it was the angel that had been assigned to Peter. I don't know how one handled it. Yeah, I do. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. And so, you know, this angel had his hands full. And so it says he struck him. I think he kicked him. Because there were no beds in prison, so he's sleeping. And so he's sleeping on the floor. And I think the angel is like, oh, you want to wake him up? <laughs> I've been waiting to do that. And, and, it, and it says, and raised him up. Now, it doesn't mean supernaturally raised him up. What, what it means is, is like, you know, when you're asleep and some, something wakes you up, you just kind of like this. Like, what's, uh, when, what's happening? I want you to see this. You got to see this. You got to get this. There is no promise without the process. And we have a part to play in the miracle. 
The activity of the miracle has started because God has heard the church and their prayer is lining up with his will for Peter's life. And his will is not for Peter to die just yet. Now, Peter does die. He's crucified upside down because he refuses to be crucified like Jesus. He says he's not worthy. So I'm not saying everything works out for Peter always, but it wasn't time for him yet. So now the angel says to him, get up, quick, get up. And his chains fell off. Now I want you to see this. There's a continuation of, of the action of the verb in the Greek tense of getting up and chains falling off at the same time. And in this where many of us have found ourselves before. It's dark, chained. The enemies surrounded us. And there's a little voice of hope that comes in and says, hey, try again. Get up. Get out of bed. And if we're honest with one another, which we said we were going to be from day one here at our church, don't you know? There had to be the thought of, like, think about, because we've all asked this before. Why? What's the point? I have tried. Like, what's, put yourself in Peter's position. Get up. Why? I'm chained. If these two guards don't kill us, the 14 other ones are going to get us. And perhaps by some way we make it past them. What about that iron gate that it takes teams of horses to open? So, like, dude, I'm sleeping. I'm comfortable in my dysfunction. I've tried this before. Like, Peter didn't say that, but we've all said it. I'm tired of trying because I'm going to mess it up again, or what's the use? Somebody else is going to let me down. When the church fervently prays into the will of God, for if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. When the church fervently prays, if you're, if you're fervently praying for a lost child that's running the streets and you don't know where they're at, you are praying for them to come home, for them to be protected and for them to come home and be saved and have an abundant life. Don't you ever doubt. That's a prayer. That's God's will. So you're fervently praying. When we pray for the lost, we're praying God's will. We know he hears us. We're praying into his will. For he wills that none should be lost, but all would be saved. Whosoever will come. So you got to see this. The chains don't fall off and then Peter gets up. And Peter doesn't get up and the chains fall. It's a continuation. Peter, by an act of faith, gets up, and in the same motion, the chains fall off. For what use is it for God to remove the chains if we're not going to get up? But the devil will tell you, why get up? You're chained. Why go get that 24-hour chip? This will be the fifth time you've done that. Baby, fifth time is your number. Like, so you see, you see what I'm getting at here. The activity of the miracle has started. But when God begins to move, you're always going to have a part. We'll talk more about this next week. He had to dress himself. What's up with that? We're in the supernatural now. How come the angel just didn't do the jet out? <laughs> Why didn't God just take him out of prison and put him over the... Why? Because not only is he encouraging us with the story, he's doing something in Peter. Because this is the Peter that Jesus looked at and said, Cephas, Peter, 
And on this rock, I will build my church. Come on. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Isn't that, there's a little irony there that they come against an iron gate. See, it's always about, it's always more about you and him than you and them. Get up, Peter. And Peter got up and the chains fell off. When the church fervently prays, knowing that God is already present and light shines in the darkness, chains fall off. It's just how it goes. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, but like, why? Can I just encourage you? Give it another shot. Now, for the church, because this is about the constantly praying church. Peter, he's got to get up. But the church, they're across town. They don't know this is going on. They're pounding. They're pounding. They're pounding the throne of God. They're approaching the throne of God with boldness in their time of need. Hey, they're finding, oh, God, move. Lord, oh, God, Herod killed James. Oh, God, you are more mighty. God, show yourself powerful. God, I don't know what verbiage, what they were using. I just know it was passionate and it was constant. Because at this moment, they realized, and maybe you're here today. You've been there. If you haven't, you certainly will at some point in this life. In the natural, there is no way out. The chains are tight. The guards of the enemy are overstaffed. The darkness is overwhelming. It's what happens when someone takes their own life. All they can see is darkness, and the only way out is a slither of light that begins to open, and they realize it's suicide. That's the plan of the enemy. And if you're struggling with that today, or you're watching online, pills are in your hand, guns are already loaded. Don't. There's another day. There's a better day. It's gonna, it will get better. We can help. Pick up the phone, call someone. We care about you. If no one's told you lately, you're important. There's more life to live. You can't change the past. The devil's lying to you. Whenever I mention suicide, I always need to say this because a lot of you were raised in just messed up religion and you were taught if someone takes their own life that they go straight to hell. That is 100% unbiblical. How sick do you think you have to be to take your own life? How sick? Pretty sick, right? Nobody says if somebody comes down with a a physical disease, oh, you're going to hell. Nobody says that. It's wrong. It goes against the Bible. I have walked into people's rooms who've taken their own life, and, find, and I found their Bible, and I found their journals, and things that they wrote to God, and the date that they were saved, and, and then, you know, how the enemy just depression, and this, that, and the other. You can't tell... Don't tell me you know how to judge the grace of God. Anyway, that's not part of the message, but I always feel the need to say that because every time I do say it, three or four of you come up to me or email me and say thank you. But I was raised in this church, and they said that is the unpardonable sin. Show me. Show me. Because this is it right here. You might show me in some other book. I don't care about your other book. This is the book that's alive. So watch this. Our part is the church. So things are bad in the flesh, in the natural. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5. For though we live in the natural, in the flesh, we don't fight. We don't, we're not at war in the natural. In other words, I mean, I can't go load up on ammo and shoot 
the devil or his demons or the, the strongholds. I can't do it. I can't blow them up. Can't get any flashbangs. Can't. Wouldn't it? But we can. Because it's a spiritual war. Because we're spiritual beings. If prayer and tears are the arms of the church whereby we fight and it is our recourse, we know that this, this book teaches us that this book is the sword of the spirit. A sword is no good unless it's attached to an arm. Somebody's got to swing the sword. Prayer is the arm that swings the sword. That's why praying the word of God is so important. We're not fighting against things that we can defeat because we're physically stronger. Paul says in the second book to the church at Corinth, it says, the weapons that we fight with, they're not natural. You can't grab them. You can't forge them. You can't shoot them. But our weapons... They're mighty in God for pulling down, demolishing strongholds. In other words, chains, bondages. And those weapons that we use in prayer in the name of Jesus, they cast down all arguments and pretensions and everything that would exalt itself against the wisdom of goodness and knowledge of God, it casts down anything that comes against God's purpose and will for your life, and it brings every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ because at the cross, Christ defeated every power and dominion. Why? What's it going to take for us to understand we can get mad as much as we want, but until we get mad enough to pray? I asked this last week, what's it going to take in your life? What's it going to take in my life? What's it going to take in the church to finally get us to a place where we would say, and I'm sorry if this isn't making you feel good. You know, I'm not here to make you feel good. My job is to provoke you. We have a different word for it, but I'll use provoke because that's more proper. (laughs) My job is to upset you unto action. I don't care if you like me. I I appreciate if you do, but I don't care. (laughs) So watch this. This is not hunky-dory goosebumps. But can I tell you we're not living in a hunky-dory goosebump world these days? We're in the last days. There are a lot of people that are going to go to hell if Jesus comes back right now. There are a lot of loved ones we have that are lost, addicted, running the streets. There are those of us who got it all together on the outside, on the inside. We're miserable. And God says, here's a weapon, the sword of the spirit. How do I swing it? Prayer. You fight in prayer. You war in prayer. Well, I've tried that before, and my prayer didn't get answered. Welcome to the club. This past Tuesday, lost one of my best friends. You can't tell me. I pleaded. I cried. I yelled at God. I screamed. I asked. I did. I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. I stayed up all night praying. I would walk and pray. I would drive and pray. I would go without sleep and pray. A little bit after 9 o'clock Tuesday morning, he graduated. I didn't pray for him to graduate yet. But I'm not God. So join the club if your prayers haven't been answered. But who am I to doubt God? Do we mourn? Yes. Do we cry? Yes. Do we come around a family? Yes. Do we be the church? Yes. 
But at some point, you got to just trust in the sovereignty of God even when it hurts like hell. You don't understand it. You got to trust that he knows better than we do. He just knows. And I will not stop trusting him because he didn't answer my prayer. And I will not stop preaching that he is good, that he is loving. His track record's too good. His track record is too good. He's a good God. I'm not going to stop praying. It's not like I, well, that didn't work. I'll never pray for anyone to get healed again. No. Uh Uh-uh. That's the devil telling you that prayer doesn't work. Prayer works. I'm a product of prayer. Peter was sleeping because he trusted the sovereignty, and the church prayed. When the church prays into God's will and his purpose, chains fall off. So for the church, here's the challenge. Will you swing the sword with the arm of prayer passionately? Anoint your kids' rooms. Pray over those bedrooms. Pray over those doors. Sneak in there when they're asleep. Put, put that anointing oil on their head. I had zits right here before I hit puberty. I never knew why. <laughs> my grandma would be sneaking in my room and I'd stay at their house just pouring oil right there in that same spot. <laughs> True. Let's war with love in prayer. See, because you say war, I thought we were supposed to love. There's no greater love than this, that you would lay down your life for another, that you would lay down an hour of your day crying out to God for somebody. That's love. So that's a challenge to us as a church. Here's a challenge if you're here today or watching online and And you heard me say earlier that God was present, but he was working from the outside in because you've not invited him into your life. Salvation's a gift. You have to receive it. The work's been done. The gift has been purchased. The debt has been paid. But will you receive it? Well, I'm not worthy. Don't you dare say that. I've done too much. Don't you dare say that because when you say that, you discount the horrificness of the cross. No, it's, it's done. You got to receive it. How do I do that? The Bible says that each one of us have been given a measure of faith. In other words, you have faith. And what you put your faith in is up to you. You can't go to a class when you're little and you're good. You can't get sprinkled as a baby and you're good. You can't, uh-uh. You, there's an age of accountability, the Bible says, where that you reach and you know that you know... And then you have a choice to put your faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. It's your choice. Doesn't need to be done out of emotion because any decision made in emotion can be lost in emotion. We're all going to meet Jesus one day. And we're going to meet him in one of two ways. We're going to run into his arms. I've told you, I personally think he's going to tackle me. Throw me up. Well done, that good and faithful servant. Or we're going to go to another throne. And we'll hear these dreadful words he was never created to say. Depart from me, I never knew you. He never wants to say those words. He doesn't want to say that to anyone. But if you're here today and you feel like you feel the Lord drawing you. You've been feeling it or maybe this is your first time you're watching online. And you know today is your day. You're taking a step. You want to put your faith in Jesus and receive the gift of salvation. I want to pray with you. Bow your heads. No one's moving except the corner teams. You say, Pastor Jason, that's me. I've been knowing it. I know it. I feel the Lord doing. I mean, I feel it in my gut. I know, I know that he's, he's, He's drawing me. He's knocking on the door of my heart. If that's you and you're in this room, I can't see you online, but you just slip your hand up. Oh, yeah. 
Yes. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Man, I see some of you raising your hand. Your tears are just flowing. Let me tell you, we're going to pray, and those are going to turn into tears of joy. Because what you're doing right now is you're letting go, and you're letting God have your life. If that's you, pray this prayer. If it's your prayer, I'm just going to give you some words to pray. God, right where you're sitting, pray this if you're watching, wherever you're at. God, thank you for loving me so much. You sent your only son to die for me. And right now, I'm, I'm confessing that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and I'm putting my faith in Jesus, in his death, burial, and resurrection. I'm putting my faith in him. And because your word says, if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, I shall be saved, I know right now that I'm a new creation. God, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you that you've brought me to this point. I give it all to you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Take my life. The mess that I've made, the things that have been done to me, the ain't, take it all. Take it all. I don't want it anymore. It's all yours. Now, right now, God's just wrapping his arms around you. The weight of the world is lifting off your shoulders. The Bible says, you may not know this, the Bible says in this moment, you are a new creation. You are the righteousness of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Please listen to me. If you raised your hand, please, 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 please. Pastor Jeremy's over here. Pastor Michael and Katrina, Pastor Anthony's up there. There's somebody up in that corner. Would you, if you were upstairs, go to one of those corners. If you're downstairs, come to one of these corners. If you're by yourself, and there were some people that raised their hand that were by themselves, like I know it's hard, but just get up and go. When I, when I have you stand up, just get up and go to one of these corners. At least let us give you a Bible, give you a hug, and pray for you. We want to celebrate with you, and we're about to do that. When we stand up, we're going to cheer madly because you just made the greatest decision you could ever make. Stand up with me, church. Praise the Lord for you and you giving your heart to Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. All right. Prayer team's coming forward right now. Come on. You raised your hand. Grab somebody beside you and take, take them with you to one of the corners. If you struggle with addiction or a loved one does, there's a room right out there to the right. We can help. Tomorrow night, night of prayer. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and his face shine upon you, and everything you do this week prosper. Amen? All right, tell somebody you love them today. You need prayer for anything, the prayer team's up here.